Welcome Color of Success podcast family. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie J. Wong. Check out my memoir, Cancel the Filter, Realities of a Psychologist, Podcaster, and Working Mother of Color, where I share my experiences in the realm of mental health, both professionally and personally. Color of Success podcast is streaming on all your favorite platforms and socials. Whether you're on the go or comfy on the sofa, you can tune in at your own comfort. As you know, we love growing discussions with our guests from our AAPI and ethnic minority communities. With so many friends and experts from different aspects of life, we love learning their stories and understanding what their success means to them. Let's get into it. In collaboration with renowned activist Malala Yousafzai, director and producer Sue Kim presents The Last of the Sea Women, an extraordinary band of feisty grandmother warriors who wage a spirited battle against vast oceanic threats. Often called real life mermaids, the Henyo divers of South Korea's Jeju Island are renowned for centuries of diving to the ocean floor without oxygen to harvest seafood for their livelihood. Today, with most now in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, their traditions and way of life are in imminent danger. But these fierce, funny, hardworking women refuse to give an inch, aided by a younger generation's fight to revive their ancestral lifestyle through social media. Sue sits down with me to discuss the mental and physical fortitude that it takes to be a henyo and the protective factors that come from being part of a community of strong and supportive women. The documentary, The Last of the Sea Women, will premiere on Apple TV on October 11th, 2024. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm super excited. I finished the movie and I absolutely loved how you both portrayed the Henyos and I watched um, Welcome to Samdari. And so this oh, yeah. was a very <laughs> nice compliment to that. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what got you interested in documenting the henyos and the spirit and grit that these women demonstrate. Yeah, well, my um, my very first experience with the henyos actually happened when I was a pretty small child. I was eight years old. Uh, the first time I went to Korea with my family to visit and uh, we went to Jeju Island because, um, you know, as you probably know from watching Welcome to Samdari, Jeju Island is sort of like the Hawaii of South Korea. Yes. It's this tropical, beautiful island. So me and my parents uh, went to Jeju for a brief visit while we were in Korea. And that's where I sort of happened upon the Henyo for the first time. I just, I remember we were by a cove and I saw this large um, gaggle of women and they were kind of walking, you know, towards the sea and they were all kitted out in their, um, their black and orange wetsuits and they're they're putting their masks on and they were just so striking there were so many of them but they were they looked so tough and so cool and they're like walking into the water and I just remembered them because they were so loud and they were so <laughs> vibrant you know and they were exactly as you see in the film they were like um, you know fighting half the time but also laughing and they just had this really big bold, confident energy that I instantly fell in love with. I was eight years old and I was like looking for female role models. And I was already like kind of a tomboyish kid and sort of a rebellious little girl. And I saw them and instantly I was like, oh, these are my people. This is, this is my tribe. This is, this is the version of Asian or Korean womanhood that I could, I can relate to, I can grow into. So I, Ever since that first time I saw the Henyo, I became fascinated with them. And I continued researching them and, you know, devouring any kind of media I could get about them. Until finally, I, as I grew up and became a filmmaker, I started going back down to Jeju to, to find them. And so um, it was on one of my trips about 10 years ago, I found a community of Henyo and they were in the water. And I started speaking to a henyo that had just come out of the water and she was 84 years old. And I, I know, amazing. I was like, and she told me she had been uh, diving that morning for like six hours. So just crazy. But she came out of the water and I asked her, where are all the younger henyo at? Because I could see all the women that were in the ocean and they all looked like grandmas. And she's the one that told me 
um, this is it. We are the last generation of the Henyo. And I think, and so that's the moment where I think I definitely been thinking about the Henyo as a potential story or a potential film um, as, as a documentary filmmaker. I thought about making this film. When I spoke to her, I think that's when it suddenly became an urgent mandate that I make this film because all of a sudden I kind of envisioned a world where people didn't know who the Henyo were. And so I really wanted to make sure that I, I did my best to create some sort of documentation of this incredible community of women while they were still here, while there was enough of them that we could show that there was this beautiful community and sisterhood of them. And while they themselves could tell their own story in their own words. So that's really, that was really when the film became a, it, it, sort of a mandate from the universe of like, you must tell this story. There's a cultural and personal um, investment that you had. And I went to Jejudo um, this past summer. And so, and yeah, we were able to to do the little tour where they had uh, filmed uh, Welcome to Samdadi. So it, it was just really powerful to yeah. then see the documentary and, and see just the overlap and all the things that really go into um building and maintaining this community. Um, so yeah. one thing that I was struck with, uh, obviously I'm a psychologist. So what do you think are the necessities mentally, the mental fortitude that it takes mm. to be a henyo and really address some of these fears of, you know, you might die at sea? Absolutely. It's, it's actually quite a dangerous occupation. And as you saw in the film, it's so dangerous that they can't get health insurance because it's considered too perilous of an occupation to insure. Um, I mean, there's so many, there's so many different characteristics I think that um, are required in order to be a henyo. I, I actually don't think athleticism necessarily is one of them. I think the henyo, by sheer determination, they train their bodies to like be in the water for that long, to mm. dive for hours every day. I think that's a skill that is cultivated over time with just the rigor of, of going to the sea every day and doing this for hours every day. But what I did try to show in the film was the sort of spectrum of, you know, we had the one Henyo who was like the best Henyo on the island. And yes. she's just this pure badass, like total athlete, so graceful when she's diving down. But then you see other Henyos that are like 92 years old or what have you. And they don't look necessarily like they would mm -hmm. be these extremely um, like robust athletic women but then you watch them in the water and they're so strong and um they can endure like the waves and and dive down to 30 feet so it's it's really a spectrum of capability so i do think that the qualities that are required are more mental um and psychological i think it's just pure determination i think you have to have that um i think anyone that starts to be a henyo it's hard for them no matter how how good of a swimmer you are just diving down and getting used to the water pressure, which is a very real thing. It's actually, um, it's something that's so present in the Henyo's lives that a lot of the women in their older years, it partly why they're yelling at each other and so loud is because they there's hearing loss on their part from good the point. water pressure. And you know, a lot of people don't know that they just think they're like yelling. It's like, no, they actually have lost their hearing because of all the up and down um, water pressure, you know, that's happening in their head. So that's hard for everyone. Staying out in the water for four to six hours a day, that's hard for anyone as well. Doing it every, and also learning the skills of how to find the sea urchin, how to pry the abalone off the rocks. All of that is just learned. It's difficult. So it's, the, I think the people that end up really becoming henyos for life, they are simply women that decided, uh, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to get better and better if I just stick with it. And it's just a matter of um, like pure resilience to like how how physically taxing it can be and how, how sort of intimidating it can be. Absolutely. And something that you mentioned was how you wouldn't be able to tell if someone was a henyo in their um, daily clothing, because when they were going to uh, protest the dumping of the wastewater, they were wearing their padded jackets and yeah. <laughs> they were just going up the stairs like it's, you know, any normal mm -hmm. day. And, um, you know, what also struck me is there was 
quite a few women that you interviewed that didn't know how to swim when they first decided to try right. this out. Um, uh, and the the big thing that I liked was that you did show the spectrum of generations in that the modern Henyo versus the women that have been together for decades. And so um, what do you, what did you find personally um, seeing the contrast or the overlap between the the differing gener the different generations? I mean, honestly, I saw a lot of similarities. I saw just pure determination, a love for the ocean, a love for nature. I think all Henyos, older and younger, were initially drawn to this work because it uh, they basically were working and living in harmony with the planet and with the ocean. Um, I that, that shared love of the sea seems to be kind of one of the most predominant characteristics that really draws a person to this occupation. Um, I saw a lot with both generations. I saw a lot of just care and protectiveness. I, I think they were, you know, as you saw in the film, the older Henyo, they sort of latch onto the younger Henyo the yes. minute they meet them. And it's so we did not, we did not anticipate that at all. We, we, we knew that there was going to be this press conference where both Henyos were going to be at. We didn't introduce them. We didn't. We also thought maybe there would be a little bit of territorial vibes from the older Henyo to the younger Henyo, and it was the complete opposite. As soon as they found out that there were younger Henyos there, they just completely like mobbed them <laughs> and like wanted to know everything about them, wanted to set them up with their sons, wanted to move I, them. Yeah, to that was hilarious. I mean, that's so Asian anti, right? But like so. But that's that protectiveness and wanting to take care of them. Um, and then I saw the same. I saw the same with the younger Henyo to the older Henyo. They're so, they're so in admiration of them, and they really look up to them. And every every time that they were together in the same space, they were always very deferential to them and kind of making sure that they were comfortable and fed. And so it it went both ways. They both had this sort of innate nurturing quality, and I see both of those generations also apply that nurturing quality to the environment. And it's the same thing. It's like they, they both, um, both generations, they love the ocean and it's the, it's where they live and work basically, but they also feel a sense of responsibility to pass on a clean ocean to the younger generations, their children and their descendants. So that, is pure caretaking, you know, even our older Henyo Jong Sun Dok, um, who goes to the UN, mm -hmm. she says it, she's like, we're older, it's not about us, it's about our children and our, and our descendants, and they're going to be in deep trouble, if this is the ocean that we pass on to them. So yeah, I, I basically saw very, very sim similar characteristics, manifesting slightly differently, but it's that same sense of responsibility, protectiveness, nurturing and caring. Absolutely. And you worked with Malala, who is a heroine to so many people. And so that leads me to talk about the climate. How were you able to collaborate on highlighting the um, climate change and the human made waste that is negatively impacting the sea and the livelihood and the spirit that it brings um, to Henyos? Well, working with Malala on this project from the beginning, it was like a blessing that fell out of the sky. Just her participation and her kind of backing this project immediately opened so many doors for us. I had actually tried um, before I met Malala and extracurricular, I had tried to get this film made for quite a few years. And um, I met with a lot of different production companies and streamers and studios. And everyone was somewhat interested in the story. I think they all saw that, oh, there, that's a really interesting story, but nobody had enough passion for it to want to green light it or to actually partner on it. So I had actually abandoned this project uh, for a while because I just couldn't get any traction on it. And then when I met Extracurricular and Malala's company, everything changed because immediately her whole team, they're all women. And as soon as I met with them and talked them through the story and I sent them my treatment, Within 24 hours, they all had convened and immediately said, we want to work with you on this. We, wow. we want to partner with you. I know. And so literally everything changed the minute Malala and her company um, jumped on board because then, then I had 
this incredible beloved humanitarian backing the project and her company. Um, and then we partnered with A24 mm -hmm. and then we pitched to Apple and everyone, everyone saw the value in telling the story. And so without Malala's participation, there would be no film. I, I truly believe that this film wouldn't exist. Um, and then as far as the climate change components that we talked about in the film, that came about through filming. So I didn't actually know how bad the sort of deterioration of the ecosystem of marine life was until I started speaking to the Henyo while we were filming. Um, and I do know that, you know, Malala and I've talked about the film quite a bit. And that is something that she also feels very passionate about is besides using this film to showcase this incredible um, and very empowering community of women, it's also vital that we start talking about what we as a species and a civilization are doing to our ocean because um, unlike other kind of climate change related disasters like wildfires or typhoons or, or flooding, those are very easy to see for, for people to the naked eye, but what's happening in the ocean only the Henyo know. They're the only people that are in the ocean every single day, year after year, seeing the kind of the destruction of the ecosystem happen before their eyes. So I know that um, Malala also felt very strongly about making sure that we included those components in our film. So people started to have that conversation. Absolutely. And what do you think we can do to kind of preserve the Henyo culture and also what would propel people to actually continue on this tradition and this profession? I mean, I think the only way that we can hopefully perpetuate this culture is to convince younger women to continue the tradition and carry on the legacy of the Henyo. Because right now, the current generation of Henyo, I think it's something like 80% of Henyo are older than 60 and, and, and like 60% of them are over 80 or there's some or over 70, like they're all in their very later years. So once that generation passes on, if we don't have another generation coming up behind them, then basically the culture and the practice is lost. I think um, the younger Henyo in our film, they do a great job of sort of rebranding the Henyo yes. culture. The for, I, <laughs> I was like, okay, dance to Jesse. Okay. Totally. I mean, that's so, it's so cute and modern yeah. and social influencer of them. But also when they talk about the Henyo lifestyle, the reasons why they came to that, that the practice of being a Henyo are very postmodern reasons. Yes. You know, so he was, she said she worked in an office in a cubicle for like eight, you know, eight years and and she just was tired of the digital exhaustion of just being stuck in a cubicle all day answering emails so she came to the henyo culture because she wanted to reconnect with nature she feels comforted and soothed when she's out at sea so that's to me that sort of break from this office life digital exhaustion life is a very postmodern dilemma and then Jungmin, kind of the same thing, where she was looking for an occupation where she could have a flexible work schedule and take care of her three kids, but also make money and contribute to the household. And that's what the Henyo lifestyle provided for. She's one of those people that didn't know how to swim. Yeah. But as soon as she like identified this culture and how it could totally work for her lifestyle, she like literally, pun intended, dove in and you know decided to really embrace this. And I think those particular reasons are very postmodern reasons. And I think maybe other young women that are in a similar situation where maybe they need a flexible uh, work schedule for, for being a working mom, or they're just tired of the nine to eight lifestyle and want something that feels a little bit more um, organic and natural and, and uh, I don't know, fulfilling. I was going to say, open it up to Silicon Valley. I bet you'll get some <laughs> some takers. And also yes. just that that notion of being a mom and how she was saying, I I dive into the sea and it, it's, it goes by faster than like yeah. coming home and being a mom. <laughs> and I totally resonated with that. I'm like, sometimes yeah. having a job is a break, but um, totally. thank, thank you so much for sitting with me today. I could talk to you for days about this, but um, 
I thank you so much for making the film and and shedding light on such a powerful community. What I what I really took away from it is there's aspects of the Henyo culture that we all hope and think and see from studies that contribute to um, longevity of life, which is like community, um, having, you know, not feeling lonely every day yeah. and isolated, um, having purpose. And yeah, thank you so, so much for sitting down with me today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. We would love for you to subscribe to the podcast and join our community on all our socials at colorsuccesspodcast.com. Looking forward to you checking out my memoir, Cancel the Filter, Realities of a Psychologist, Podcaster, and Working Mother of Color on Amazon and wherever books are sold. I'd love to hear your Cancel the Filter moments.